Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Martin Lofton, and this is me. I work on OpenStack, and I, I work for Red Hat. Here's how you get in touch with me. Okay, so I'm here to talk about OpenStack, um, but it's not, you know, it's not a, an architecture talk. It's not going into too much details about OpenStack. What I'm really getting at here is a whole lot of waffle that's going to end up with a point I want to make about um, the difficulties with deploying OpenStack and the, the, the challenge that the project needs to address there. And I think it actually goes back to the point um, being made up there about, about uh, helping users install and upgrade uh, OpenStack. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what OpenStack as a project is trying to build, what our users are trying to do with that, that software, um, <clears throat> a little bit about how OpenStack is architected, and then you know, talk about, talk about how, how best to deploy that architecture. So OpenStack is trying to build software for large scale infrastructure as a service, but more specifically, um, AWS style clouds, right? So everybody wants to call their service the cloud, um, and maybe they're all valid uses of the word cloud. But I think what we're really trying to do in OpenStack is an AWS style cloud. So if you know EC2, if you know EPS, S3, VPC, that's that's basically what we're trying to build with that, that, that style of a service. Um, so again, trying to really get at what OpenStack is doing or what it's not trying to do. Um, you can go through all these diff different distinctions about what you know, what is cloud and what, what makes OpenStack's type of cloud different from other types of cloud. So we're not trying to build a data center virtualization solution where <coughs> you know you take your servers that were running on bare metal and move them onto the to virtualization and you manage them exactly the way before. Um, that's not the way you think about EC2 and that's not the way you should think about OpenStack. Um, people talk about public versus private versus hybrid clouds, and they try and really say that OpenStack is public clouds, something else than private clouds. But in reality, you know, these, these terms are kind of used as well. There's different types of private clouds, and I, I think OpenStack is perfectly suited to private clouds if you're trying to deploy it, uh, you know, a service that looks like EC2 or, or AWS within your organization. Another way of thinking about it is what applications are running on top of, of, of this OpenStack cloud. Um, I don't think you want to be running scale up for sensitive applications like your big old mail server or a big old database. That's not the sweet spot for EC2, and I don't think it's the sweet spot for OpenStack. Um, if you've got scale out for tolerant applications, I think that's what you want to be running on OpenStack. Um, another distinction people talk about is uh, uh, Pets versus cattle, right? If you think about your server as a pet, um, that's not good. That's not a good use case for EC2. Really. If it's going to be pagers going off in the middle of the night, people are running around the place when the server goes down, um, you know, that's not what you want to be running on EC2. What you want to be running on EC2 is, is servers that you think about as cattle, right? One dies, you put it down humanely and you spin up another one and you've got lots of them. So that's Another way of thinking about kind of what sweet spot for OpenStack is, um, it's for cattle, not for pets. And I keep talking about AWS style, and I think I need a dance word or something. No, AWS style, Amazon style clouds. So I think I've made that point now. So if OpenStack users are trying to build um, an Amazon style cloud, you know, what, what is that, right? It's a service, first of all. And, you know, we've used the term service in Unix world a little bit, but what we're talking about here is um, this is someone who's trying to be a supplier of, of a utility, right? So a computing utility, whether it's compute or storage or networking, they're trying to supply that as a, as a utility or a commodity. Um, and they're doing that via an API, right? They've given you an API and you can access the, this, this uh, utility through the API. And most importantly, they're trying to build a business model around this, even if it's a Kind of non -profit, profit organization offering the cloud, there's still got to be some business model that you know, uh, makes it possible to offer that service. And what we call these is service providers. Uh, so OpenStack users, to me, are OpenStack deployers, they're service providers, they're, they're, they're trying to set up a service. And what I want to go through here a little bit is what, what do service providers think about, what do they care about, um, and, and how can we help 
is essentially the point I'm going to be getting to eventually here. Um, so the first thing, obviously, service providers think about is, is their customer experience. Um, and let me think of this where I'm going to get to. Yes. So obviously, it's very important that if you're providing service, customers have good uh, experience. Um, part of that is service levels. So it's like how reliable your service is, how um, you know, fast your VMs are, how much storage they have, what the, 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 uh, how many IOPS you, the, you get for your storage, how fast the networking is, um, all that kind of stuff. And the important thing with service levels is to actually um, set expectations so users know what kind of service level they're, they're going to be um, expected to get and to keep it consistent. And obviously, service providers care about competition too, right? Because they're offering a service you're competing. And this even applies to private clouds. <clears throat> if you're setting up a private cloud, you're, you're competing with public clouds. Now, a lot of IT organizations uh, don't typically think about that, but um, you know, they might have a way internally for you to request a VM, and it might take a couple of weeks, and the manager needs to sign off on it or whatever. So you go off to Amazon and you get your VM there, and you don't tell anyone about it. And what the industry calls that rogue IT, right? You're, you're going rogue and you're doing your own thing. So what IT organizations are now finding is they have to actually compete with this, this rogue IT, and they have to actually offer uh, a service that's <coughs> as good as EC2 and is, you know, even it's competitive on all levels with the EC2 service before they can get their internal users back using their private cloud. So that sets them down the road of, of being a, you know, a real service product provider within, even within their organization. But public clouds too, right? They, they're, they're setting up a public cloud based on OpenStack. They, they want to understand how they're competing with other OpenStack clouds. One obvious way to think about competition is pricing. How do you price your different resources? Um, and pricing isn't just about the per um, per resource cost and the capital cost for a VM for an hour. It's, it's you know stuff like how fine grained your building is. So is your building uh, per hour or per minute or per day? Some some users will watch uh, per minute building maybe because they're really short lifecycle instances, and maybe that's how your how difference is from other clouds. <coughs> or you might have free usage to you, or you might even go into Amazon's style and reserve and spot instances. And I'm getting to a point here. Um, before you can think about pricing, you have to think about what your margins are going to be, right? And you don't want your margins, you, you, you need to know what your margins are going to be, you, you don't want your margin to be too high because you're missing out on a competitive opportunity, right? You don't want them to be like, too low because they're not going to succeed to my fail. Before you can think about margins, you have to think about costs, right? You have to really understand how much is costing you to provide your service. Um, you need to know, before you can set a price for an instance for an hour, you need to know how much that costs you. And ideally, your costs would scale linearly. And what I'm trying to show here is, on the right-hand side at the top here, this would be the cost of operating your cloud. And as you get more and more users, and your users are running more, using more resources, and you want the cost of running your cloud to go up linearly. Because if it goes up linearly, your per, per resource cost is flat. And so you can have your price just above your per resource cost, and a nice predictable margin on top of that. And this is a completely idealistic, non real world situation. But what you don't want is uh, the cost of your cloud to go up in this non-linear fashion. Um, so a jump like this might be, for example, um, you realize you're kind of hitting the limit of what your cloud can, can cope with, and you have to buy, you, know, you have to rebuild your entire infrastructure, it costs you a whole bunch of money. And so the cost of operating your cloud goes up massively, and then over time you're kind of paying that back again. But what that translates to in per resource cost is this kind of really unpredictable um, per resource cost you're kind of keeping your price still at the same level because you don't want to expose your users to that, that price difference. Um, and that makes it really difficult to predict what your margins are going to be. So the idea is this um, linearly scaling cost. So what, what am I getting out of all this? Um, 
all of this is business decisions, right? This is you're operating your cloud, and you know you're, you're thinking about your competition, you're thinking about your service levels, you're thinking about your uh, your, your price and model and all this. That's a big business. Right? That's a guy in a suit that wants to be making all those decisions, right? And if you're deploying your cloud. <coughs> You don't want to be subject to, you know, you want to set this up to make it easy to make those decisions and change them. Because business guy wants agility, right? He wants to be able to change his mind uh, about service levels, about, uh, about pricing, really understand pricing and costs and, and change margins. And how do you, as a person deploying OpenStack, make that possible for the business guy? Another thing about business guy, he wants growth, right? <coughs> it's actually yeah. it's um, it's funny when you think about when you when you think about private clouds in particular, private clouds, you know, they've got certain sorry, non non kind of service provider private clouds and kind of data center virtualization. They might have you know a hundred hypervisor machines and they've only got budget this year for buying that number of machines and they're actually trying to limit growth in usage because they don't want to go over their you know, budget for the year. Whereas if you're thinking like a service provider, you want growth, right? The more you, you never want to turn away users because you're making a, uh, <coughs> you're making a margin here and you just want to grow and you want to grow and you want to grow. And so how do you build your cloud for that growth? How do you build your cloud so that uh, if you actually are really successful and you get lots and lots of users, that you grow and you grow and you grow and that your architecture and your deployment can scale for that? And the flip side of that is, if you fail, you want to fail fast and you want to fail cheaply. So you don't want to have a big massive upfront investment um, to prepare for all this growth. You want to start small and grow with the, and, and, and grow as you actually succeed. And that's all about capacity plan. Um, so you know, what kind of capacity do you expect? How do you, or what kind of usage do you expect? What capacity do you need for that? How will that grow over time? That's that's all the kind of stuff you need to think about. And as I said, I do think this applies to private cloud too. Um, if you can set up your private cloud so you're thinking like a service provider, um, I think it's a really good way to approach it because again, and actually the, the key thing to setting up your private cloud as a service provider is to implement chargeback. Because once you've got chargeback, if you get more users, your, your effective budget grows and grows and grows. Like you're actually trying to attract users and grow your, your internal service. And this changes IT organizations from being like no men, I think they want to say no to your request, to actually they want to say yes to your request. So, how am I doing on time? 15 minutes. So, that was a whole pile of awful, and uh, it's, it's, it's context, right? Um, how do we go about making that possible for open stuff users? And so, if we're trying to implement an Amazon style cloud, uh, they, why not look at what Amazon have done? Right? Maybe it's not particularly uh, the right thing to say that we want to you know, learn from proprietary software or whatever, but they've done it pretty well, so, so what do they do? Werner Vogels, he's the CTO of Amazon, he does a pretty good keynote. I actually recommend listening to some of his keynotes. Um, and one he did recently, he talked about 21st century application architecture. Very grand setting, I know. But he talks about four commandments of 21st century application architecture. And this actually makes a whole bunch of sense in the context of OpenStack. And to make it clear, this is kind of confusing. All of this stuff makes sense if you're deploying applications on top of OpenStack, but I think all these principles actually make sense in the context of how OpenStack is architected and how your deployment should be architected. So the four commandments of 21st century application architecture. One is um, your application should be controllable, right? Think about everything as a, a programmable resource. Um, you want to break down your application into really small, loosely coupled, stateless building blocks and automate the whole thing. That's controllable. It, it, it should be resilient, right? So you don't want um, single points of failures. So you want to have um, resiliency through, through kind of horizontal scale out. You want to have failure zones. Um, and you also want to have continuous deployment so that you know, when you change something, it, it's not going to break. <coughs> it should also be adaptive. Um, so if your application architecture is adaptive, that means you can you know, 
to a fair. Make changes as the business guy wants changes. It's, it's really possible, really easy to make changes. And so part of being adaptive is kind of late binding decisions, right? So as much of your kind of deployment decisions as possible, you want to make those late bindings. So where you deploy a service to, what size a machine you deploy a service to, all that kind of stuff that you can make, those decisions as late as possible. That means when the business guy changes his mind, it's, it's really it's really easy to, to, to implement those changes. And finally, um, your application should be data driven, right? So your your adaptive automated uh, your adaptive and automated application, um, you know, how do you drive that those changes? How do you drive that automation? You drive it with data. So that means like instrument everything all the time, know know everything that's going on in your application, and most importantly, have kind of business relevant data. So it's like Gather data about the things that actually affect your users and that the business guy cares about, and that can be used to actually for the business guy to, to make decisions and, uh, and uh, make changes to the <laughs> So the ideal kind of, I mean, you're shown pretty well, I think, in this Amazon keynote, the ideal kind of scenario is where you know, the application is deployed um, and the architecture of that allows basically the business guy to sit there in front of a bunch of dials and tweak how the service appears to users and kind of um, make all the business decisions without actually having to you know, go through negotiations with the people who are actually operating the, the application. Ideal world, but you know, we, can, we can start thinking about how to, to start getting towards that model. And so now, I uh, open oh, <clears throat> the thing about OpenStack is we've actually built and architected OpenStack like this. Um, most of the like, OpenStack is actually broken down into you know really small, stateless um, building blocks that are, that are scale out or horizontally scalable. Um, we actually really nice architecture in terms of these you know, four commands <laughs> we can kind of tick off all the boxes. But then people take that architecture and how to actually take the application architecture and deploy it in a way that the, the deployment kind of meets those those um, those commandments. So I'm just really simplifying things here. I'm just thinking about a couple of say services within Nova. So OpenStack architecture is a lot more complicated than this, but in Nova you've got the API service, you've got a message bus and a database and a scheduler, right? And so this is like your controller node, and you've got all your your compute nodes over here separately. So this is like your machine that's controlling your your uh, your, your cloud. Um, so often, often when people are just getting started with OpenStack, um, you know, their their first deployment and kind of figuring out how it works, they put all the services on a, on a single controlling machine, and and away they go. And then they say, well, wait a minute, what happens if that fails? So let's set up active passive uh, mode here, and we'll just fail over to another one of those if that happens. Now, this works, um, but if you're going to build a large scale cloud on this, if you're expecting um, a lot of growth, right, these two guys have got to be big ass old machines. Um, they've got to be, you know, they've got to set these machines up so they're going to handle, you know, what you expect your, your top capacity of your cloud to actually be. And that really is kind of like a massive upfront investment. And what happens when you reach the limit of what this, you know, um, this architecture can handle? So how do we get users beyond this kind of deployment model, which clearly doesn't meet all those commandments, to this kind of controllable, resilient, adaptive, and data-driven um, <coughs> deployment architecture? So I guess the way OpenStack should be deployed to, to kind of meet that um, to meet uh, those kind of four commandments um, is, you know, you, the, the API service is horizontally scalable, the scheduler service is horizontally scalable, you can set up a cluster of message buses, the database is, uh, you still have to stick, or stick around with the old kind of active active or active passive or failover type mode. Um, but in that low balance in front of the APIs, this is kind of the deployment architecture for OpenStack um, you want to get to. Um, but how do, you, how do you do that, right? So if you look at something like this, you okay, let's implement that. Are we talking about 
So if you've got a, a, maybe a hardware load balancer, or you've got a, a load balancer running on a dedicated machine, and then you've got four machines that are API servers and four machines that are scheduler services. Uh, or do you say, you know, we run API servers and scheduler services together? It's, we, we as a project in OpenStack basically say it often to you about this. This is, you know, either you <coughs> figure this all out yourself if you're, you know, using OpenStack directly, um, maybe you've got some tools to kind of help you uh, deploy all those, but you kind of need to make the decisions yourself of, of how you can deploy them, or you maybe go with one of the, uh, the, the OpenStack solutions that say maybe a hardware appliance and they've already decided how to do this for you. Um, but with a deployment like that, you're going to need monitoring, you're going to need alarms, you're going to need all the scale and HA fixing, all that good stuff. So I really see this as OpenStack's next big challenge. How do we, as a project ourselves, actually <coughs> help users to, to deploy like this? Um, and uh, you know, I, I think we've seen a bunch of different ideas about how people should do it. And, uh, I think we should really work, start working on tools that, that kind of implement these ideas. Um, so one idea is, you know, each of these components, each of these small stages building blocks, you don't just think of them as a server role, right? You've got a, a public recipe to describe those server roles. And so if you decide to put the um, API servers and scheduler servers on the same machine, that's just assigning um, two roles to that, that uh, scheduler service. Um, I think that's a lot of how a lot of tools at the moment think about this. It's it's a configuration management problem, right? Um, but I think you've still got the problem there is you know, how do you scale out the API service, for example? You can't assign multiple roles to a machine, um, as an example. So maybe what you want to do is you want to run all these services on a kind of more traditional ver virtualization management solution, right? So say you take over it and you've got five API servers and they're all running different VMs. And that means you can move your API services around the, the actual physical machines that, that you're using to host the cloud. Uh, you know, maybe you, you use like migration and uh, you know, load balancing type stuff there. Uh, I think it's actually a nice solution, but the problem here is, uh, do you say to people, okay, you want to deploy OpenStack, now first set up uh, you know, a virtualization management solution, like, like Overt or vSphere or whatever, um, you've now got two things within your kind of deployment architecture that can launch VMs. Does that make any sense? Maybe it does. Maybe you already have this and you're setting up focus back alongside it. Um, another idea that I know people are playing with is you, know, you take the idea of OpenStack bare metal, use that to deploy your compute codes, and uh, have OpenStack also deploy VMs, and then describe your OpenStack application in terms of a, a heat template, right? So heat is allows you to deploy open, our applications on top of OpenStack and basically set up that kind of a, that model of, of these different interconnected services within the application and launch those. Um, so this idea is all about taking that model and use that for actually deploying OpenStack itself. Um, so you've got an OpenStack service set up maybe as an appliance or something and you're using that to deploy OpenStack, which Kind of just is really head wrecking, but I know HP, for example, are actually working on this. That's why they're actually working on OpenStack bare metal. They want to test OpenStack by deploying OpenStack using OpenStack. So, all my waffle was just getting to this summary of OpenStack has this great scale of architecture, but we really need to build the tools that will allow people to deploy in, in a scale of way. Um, pretty simple point, and you guys had to listen to me for 25 minutes getting to that simple point. Um, but I think going through all the kind of, um, really trying to get into the head of what service providers are trying to do um, with OpenStack really um, <coughs> shows you why all this stuff is important. So for example, you know, why is it really important that costs scale linearly? Um, you, you only really get to think about that if you're thinking about um, you know, trying to figure out what your, your price for the resources is, is and how to have, kind of have a predictable margin. Uh, so that's me. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And any questions before you get t shirts? <laughs> Um, I don't actually know what Bosch is, but he's just 
No, not really. Heat is actually an implementation of. Uh, sorry, the question was: Is heat similar to uh, the Edwards Bosch? Well, heat is actually an implementation of the kind of same idea that Amazon had with cloud formations. So it's this: you've got like a JSON file that says, you know, I've got a web server and I've got a database, and to to run this application, run, run those two um, machines that kind of work together. Put a load balancer in front of it. That's kind of what I'm 